a question. Are there other uh, non-physicians, and I hate the word non-anything, but for want of a better word, that um, write orders in hospitals, for example, and we've brought this up at other meetings, uh, optometrists, podiatrists, who do write orders um, in, in, in hospitals. I don't know about Connecticut, so that's just a question. This, although the CM, as we keep saying, is identical so that, you know, whatever CNMs get or whatever privileges they have should apply to CMs. There shouldn't really be any question about that. But I just thought I would raise the issue of other professions because you did mention only APRNs and uh, physicians. The other is an anecdote that I love to tell. I had a graduate of my program who was working in a hospital and I don't remember exactly, she didn't even tell us all the details, but it was some discussion that a physician, a resident who she had worked with for about three years was having with, with somebody else. And he kind of ran up against a wall and he looked at her and he said, oh, come on, you're a nurse. Can you please explain this? And she said to him, no, in fact, I can not explain it, but I'm not a nurse. And he had no clue after working with her for three years that she that her practice or her credentials or her qualifications or her ability to step in in this particular situation was any different from any of the nurse midwives he had worked with. In fact, he didn't even know who was a nurse midwife or a midwife. And in fact, in New York, that distinction is no longer a legal distinction. Our licenses all say licensed midwife. So as I've mentioned before, Beth is a CM. She has a New York license. I'm a CNM. I became a midwife way before the CM credential. Both of our licenses say licensed midwives. So that's our legal credential. But I always love that anecdote because after working with somebody for three years, he just didn't know because her practice and her competence and her knowledge base was, I'm going to say it again, identical to the nurse midwives he worked with. It's just an anecdote, but I think it's a very telling one. Right. Thank you. Muted. Yep, no, I got it now. Um, oh, Dana's here. Oh, okay. Hello, Dana. Welcome. Um, all right. Does does anyone else have any more comments or anything to share? Um, Dante, did your questions around collaboration get answered? Yeah, I think we mostly covered that last time when we were talking about how there's sort of um, a continuity of the midwifery free model of care and the kinds of collaborative relationships that happen in a variety of settings. Um, and I think we, we sort of got a sense of what other states are doing. Um, I'm just curious. So it, in your slides, Richard, you said that Minnesota and Pennsylvania are kind of in a similar phase of this process as Connecticut. Can you just give us a little detail about what what's happening over there and and whether it looks similar to uh, what we're what where we are here in our state? If you if you're yes. aware. Um, I'm unmuted. Um, yeah, so in Pennsylvania, there's a midwifery modernization act, they call it, mm -hmm. and that it deals with a lot of midwifery issues in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, they're licensed under the Board of Medicine. Um, so one of the aspects of the Midwife Modernization Act is to license CMs. And you'll notice that Jefferson University's program is in Pennsylvania, so mm -hmm. it's important to get that. Uh, and Minnesota is pretty much going through the same process that we are. Um, and I have their documents. They look very similar to what we've submitted and the process is very similar with and then that's just dealing with adding cms as opposed to pennsylvania where it's dealing with a lot of midwifery issues right in, in one act thank you so it, i think pennsylvania is going to be i think they just um i think it's going to the, the legislation is going to be introduced in the next legislative session and they're very optimistic. They got support from everybody. That's great. Thank you. Thanks for sharing the, the details. Thank you, Ronnie. 
So I just want to make a small point, and I've learned this from my sociology and anthropology friends, and that is that once a phenomenon reaches 20% of a population, it's pretty much here to stay. It's not going to go away. It's kind of indelible. Well, if you add those three states to the seven states that have already recognized or accepted the CM credential, we've reached 20%. So I don't think that, you know, if, if I think it's going to be a national trend. And Karen may be able to speak to this better than I can, but for a long time, it was New York, New Jersey, and New York, and New Jersey, and maybe Delaware. It was only a very, very, very few states. And then in the last few years, there's been uh, increased trend. I mean, I used to say at this rate, you know, all 50 states will accept the CM credential in 100 years. But if the new trend, which is much quicker, many more states accepting it much more quickly, it's not going to be that long. And I do think if, you know, that it is an, it will become so entrenched with just a few more states that will never go back again. And thank you to my anthropology and sociology friends for that little tidbit. I think it's called a tipping point. Oh, and um, oh, Dana. Hi, first apologies for being late. I, it's a very crazy time of the semester. Um, if it wasn't mentioned, um, one of the most elegant solutions we've seen was actually in Colorado, where they just added and certified midwife anywhere where it said certified nurse midwife. Oh, and Dana, can you um, can you talk about the, the Colorado University program that's about to launch for CN? Yeah, I, can, I don't have very much details, but I know that it's in a college of nursing, and I think that they will be able to, um, I think that they will be able to use their resources wisely to be able to have um, shared classes where things overlap, for example, bioethics and foundations of healthcare. Um, because it doesn't matter what field you're in if you're learning how to do a sterile field. And then they will separate so that the people who need to learn nursing and nursing diagnosis and nursing care and care plans and management and theory will go in one direction. And the people who need to learn midwifery and the science and art of midwifery will go in a different direction. And I think that could open up, um, like I always thought that a nursing program wouldn't, wouldn't be able to house a CM program. But if they wrinkle out all the details, then are we have two programs in Connecticut, Fairfield and um, Yale. Uh, so theoretically, they could open up CM educational routes, which would be exciting. And, and it also bears stating that in many parts of the world, there are colleges of midwifery and nursing and i think that that's that that's important they're not joint they're just they're viewed almost as sister professions that share that biopsychosocial framework even though they are distinct okay, thank you i um so i have a question and it's and so i'm kind of familiar with the answer but i think this would be a good place to hear from you all about the question um and I, you know, I recognize, you know, as, as I'm working with uh, Dante on this broader midwifery group, that there's a lot of different types of midwives. Um, and there's, even within the midwifery community, there's, you know, some tension sometimes between the different types. Um, but I think one, you know, certified midwives are, from what I understand, sort of rare in Connecticut. Um, and there's like two programs, but, but I think people, you know, it's like certified professional midwife, certified midwife. So, you know, do you all have like, you know, kind of a, an explanation of sort of what's different between a certified professional midwife and a certified midwife? And I think that'd be important to put that in the report. Because um, I think there's, you know, there's, I think there's numbers of certified professional midwives. Um, more so than the CM. So if anybody wants to talk about that a bit, uh, Richard. The um, well certified, they have a different accrediting body for their educational programs, and they also have an, a different national certifying exam. And they are um, 
they're actually licensed in more states than uh, CMs are, uh, but they're usually limited to out of hospital, um, either home birth or birth center, birth center uh, births. And each state varies in terms of, um, I don't know if any have prescriptive authority in any of the states, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure of that. Um, so it's just a matter of when we talk to the public about being a, a consumer who's just aware of the status of any provider they go to, but in terms of midwifery, if they're pregnant, uh, just knowing the difference and where they practice and and that. But we're, um, you know, my fan, you know, in, in developed countries other than the United States, a midwife is a midwife is a midwife. Uh, the same way in our country, if you call someone a, a, doc, a medi medical doctor, there isn't very, there are the DO and the MD, but the, 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 there's absolutely no distinction now between those two. Um, but it is an issue in every state, uh, just having to deal with um, that variety. Um, and each state has dealt with it differently. Anybody else have anything? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Dana. You've got your hand up. So um, Karen Kelly shared a um, comparison chart that um, many people spend a lot of time bringing up to date. I think it's very valuable and extremely clear. It's three pages and it probably answers every question um, that people may have about the different midwifery credentials. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about the increase in um, CPMs versus CMs is that you, we've been talking about this. This is actually Katie Dolly's concept, so I want to give her credit. Um, she's a historian of midwifery and also a midwife. Um, that there's the chicken versus the egg phenomenon. In order to go to school to become a certified midwife, even though it is much less expensive and way more efficient in terms of time um, than the CNM, it's still graduate school in the way that graduate school is conceived of in the United States. And I don't know anyone who is willing to plunk down that kind of investment without the ability to be licensed. And I think when you start to look at the number of CMs in New York that brought in the education program and the ability to work at the same time or relatively at the same time, even with one program, um, the number of CMs who have hospital privileges, who are working, who are there, it's substantial and it's normal. Whereas if you have states that marginalize the CM or place restrictions on them, people or, or give them the same scope of practice as a CPM, no one is going to pay for that education. They're just not because there's, you can't get the return on investment. So that if you want to have midwives who are able to contribute to frontline maternity care, seeing people who are pregnant as people who also may need primary care and who can operate in any setting where birth happens, and you want them to have that kind of training, then you need to create regulations that are enabling. Thank you, and Richard? What, could we send that document that, that Dana just mentioned that explains the CNM, the CM, and the CPM? Um, is that, is yeah, that we it? have it. Yeah. Um, uh, Karen you have just it, shared right? it. Yeah. And once okay. I saw it, I was like, oh, yeah, I remember seeing this thing. So thank you for sharing that. <laughs> yeah. I was scrambling around this morning trying to find it. Um, and then a question. So what? So when we end today, what are the next steps in this process? So um, the, the department is um, required to develop a report um, that it, uh, it uh, on this process, on the discussion. Um, and, you know, we, the department sort of just stays neutral in this report writing for the most part. We just kind of present that, you know, this is what the 
This is what the CMs are proposing. These were some of the concerns that were raised. Um, you know, these are some of the answers to it. And, you know, it really kind of, I think what what these re, what this process does is it it lays a nice groundwork for the legislators to have something to kind of use as a barometer um, if they consider raising legislation um, related to this. And, you know, and, you know, and if it's raised and if there's hearings, you know, other folks will come out. Um, of the woodwork to either support it or have concerns or whatever. Um, but, you know, this kind of is kind of like a pregame in a sense um, and a way to kind of gather the information in one place so that there's an understanding of, you know, what what is being asked for and what, you know, constituencies have concerns or issues with it. Um, and also, I think a lot of the discussion here is sort of what are the answers to those questions or concerns? And I think you all came up with a lot of them for sure. So so that's always helpful. I mean, we have, you know, like as I said, we're doing four of these groups right now. And a lot of them, you know, some of the other ones, you know, everybody's heels are dig, you know, dug in on both sides. And, you know, we're not really getting anywhere. But um, you know, I think that this group is is a friendlier group and a more open group. And, you know, I think a lot of folks are just kind of looking to build their understanding and get some clarification on things, which is I think it's it makes for a good scope of practice process. Uh, but the department um, will get that report and we'll send you a final copy and um, it's due to the legislature by February 15th. So. And uh, who who in the legislature would decide if a statute is going to be written or somebody um, do? It would likely be the public health committee, but things can come from anywhere. You know, I've seen stuff, you know, how did this end up in the labor committee? Um, you know, so it, it can happen anywhere, but it's it's likely um, if it is raised that it would be through the, the public health committee. And then who determines what the language of the bill would be? That well, so the way that works is, you know, you'll something will be um drafted and sometimes it might just start with a little like one sentence you know to to license certified midwives but um so the the language gets drafted and then folks can have input into it but and to say oh no this should be like this way this should look this way and the department looks at it you all everybody's free to look at it it's kind of open process um and people can provide testimony um if there's a public hearing people can come provide uh, testimony in person but in the end it's the legislature that determines what the language is and then the department is the you know would be the body who implements it um, if something happens um dante yeah, um, just a couple points. One is that, like like Chris said, it's many many cooks are in that kitchen. It's it's um, a process that goes through various phases of public participation. Um, um, but just to go back a step, the legislature is not necessarily going to look at this report and then come up with a proposal, right? Like they need to hear from uh, constituents. Um, you know, moving in that direction. And there needs to be sort of a dedicated uh, group working on that. And then, which brought me to my next point, which is that maybe, Chris, you could share a little bit about what that process might have been like briefly for the doulas who recently, um, they didn't go for licensure. They they have a, a category of voluntary certification um, that's that's new here in Connecticut. And so that process might be a little bit informative um, to to folks here for what that looked like to actually end up with an, a statute um, for their certification. Yeah, yeah, and thank you, Dante, for bringing that up. And I, and I actually think this request is a little bit more like the most of the requests we see versus the doula. The doula was, is very different and it ended up being voluntary. But but so just I think as as Dante was talking and, and saying, like, yeah, it's not like the legislators are going to sit down and read the report and go, oh, this sounds wonderful. Let's draft some language now. Um, you know, it takes folks to 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 push this. I mean, this is one tool, um, an informational tool um, to help guide the process. But and so I'll just say one of my, you know, a lesson I learned the first year I ever had to do this, like, I don't know, 2016 or something like that. Um, you know, I'm sitting here all, 
excited, doing my first scope of practice, genetic counselors. It was a pretty, you know, um, you know, it wasn't too controversial or anything. And as I'm doing it, you know, all of a sudden I see an email come up and it's like, there's a bill proposed to license genetic counselors already, and I'm not even done with my report yet. So, <laughs> you know, so they had their constituents that were already, you know, ahead of the game, like letting their, you know, kind of going to their legislators and saying, this is what we want. This is how we're going to go. And, you know, we want you to support this. And so, you know, that's how often um, language gets proposed. So, um, you know, the, the doulas have been a little bit more, you know, it's it's kind of evolved in a way. Um, you know, there was a, a group of, of doulas, but not a professional association um, who sort of informally um, worked with a, um, um, Health Equity Solutions and the um, Connecticut Health Foundation to, to kind of promote the use of doulas. And a lot of it was based on the, you know, sort of the emerging evidence that, you know, doula services during pregnancy, you know, showed good potential out, you know, potential improvement in health outcomes um, for uh, babies and mothers. So, you know, that there was like a big push that way. But but this is actually more the traditional one. You're like, we have an, and they don't have a, you know, they don't have a nationally sort of established scope of practice, a national organization that's all on the same page with the training. Um, you all, the certified midwives have the certifying body, accrediting body, um, the kind of standard. Um, that's true. And doulas are not healthcare providers. Um, you know, you've got those pieces set up already that we see with other professions that get licensure. Um, so it's sort of less labor intensive and a um, little bit nicer and easier to to come up with something that works because the model's already set up, um, even though it's not really widespread through the country yet. Um, you've got the sort of all the pieces there that generally are, are what, you know, make licensing pretty straightforward. Uh, that makes sense. So, oh, Ronnie, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thank you. So I don't know exactly what has already been done in Connecticut. I was just asked to address, you know, with this group, this issue. But I can just tell you very briefly what was done in New York, and this is over 20 years ago. There were a group of very dedicated people, and New York is a large state geographically, so the person who took the lead was somebody who lived near our state capital. And they visited the legislature like once a week. They And they, at the time, since it was so new, they brought curriculum to show legislators. They brought curriculum from Europe showing that these are, you know, midwifery and not nurse midwifery programs. You have a way big advantage because you have curriculum and you have all this stuff right here in this country. But the most, the key thing I think that was done was to identify one person in the legislature who became the midwifery champion. And that person just retired about a year ago, but that person was the midwifery champion for about 30 years. Uh, that's Dick Gottfried. He's also the champion of single party payers. So he's a very progressive, very liberal. I think he was a representative, an assembly person and not a state senator, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, ultimately, because only one person is needed to introduce a bill, ultimately you need a similar person in the other house. Excuse me, but um, I think you just need, so I, that would be my recommendation is to identify a person in each, I'm assuming you have, two houses in Connecticut, my ignorance, um, and try to get those people because that's who introduces legislation. It comes from a legislator and get the midwifery. We worked on the wording with the legislature and the final wording took 10 years to fix. It had some major problems with it, <clears throat> but we were also getting a midwifery bill period. So we were licensing CMs and CNMs together. We had never had formal licensure. I'm sorry for my voice, but um, I went to the Thanksgiving parade and was shouting and it hasn't come back yet. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we've got tickets. So anyway, that would be my recommendation is that you, you very carefully and deliberately and intentionally find two people, one in each, part of the legislature and lobby them and lobby them and lobby them and lobby them 
and asked to work or even draft legislation because they're busy. They would be very happy if you drafted legislation. You can see the New York legislation. I don't know if it's one bill now or if it's one bill with a couple of amendments. The original bill had some problems. That's it. All right, thank you, Ronnie. Yeah, that, that's how it happens. Um, I'm just wondering how many people here are from Connecticut or live in Connecticut? Okay, all right, good. Okay, all right, excellent. And Lisa right. Craig, who's not here, is from right. Connecticut. Okay, yeah, Matt, you use that word champion. And after I, after I hung up, I was like, um, I mean, after I, after I put myself on mute, I was like, oh yeah, legislative champion, that's the word um, <laughs> to you. So that's always key. Um, Richard? Uh, just another civics question. So in the next legislative session, are there, is it one part or two parts or does it matter when the bill gets introduced? Sooner is always better. It's one part, it's a short session. Starts in February. But don't give up if it takes a lot of sessions before it's actually introduced. Yeah, that, that's true. And especially sometimes during a short session, um, sort of new things might be less likely to be introduced. Um, but yeah, and I, I've heard people say, some people say it takes at least three years, but yeah, I'm not sure. I've seen it all happen quicker too than that. <laughs> um, right. Um, Richard, your hands up again. Yeah, okay. just a, a process question. What would cause someone to yell at a Thanksgiving Day parade, Ronnie? <laughs> <laughs> the floats, of course. What else? <laughs> you, you yell at floats? Yay! <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you, Dana. If it is possible, and I, it may be something that we can download, I'm just not as familiar with the Connecticut website because I'm faculty at Jefferson, um, which is in Pennsylvania. If it's possible to get a Word document of the current CNM um, statute and regulations, that is something um, CMAC, uh, which is the National Professional Association Committee that works on this, has a lot of experience writing um, possible language to as a potential starting point. Um, so if that's something that would be considered acceptable and not overstepping, that's something that we have some experience with. You're on mute, Chris, but we just both, Maley and I, I both all, just all, put all it in there in the chat. DPA <laughs> folks were all racing to find it, but uh, Dante won Dante. the race. So thank you, Malia, for looking too. <laughs> Okay, so I'm getting the sense that we've thoroughly discussed this and addressed all the sort of questions some concerns um, as best we can at this point. Um, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's, and any time that this process happens and if there's legislation, there's, there'll be more of kind of what we have. And I think too, I think what this process does too is it prepares the people advocating for this to sort of know what they might hear, um, you know, when it, when and if a bill gets raised and what are the issues that are coming up, because there's probably not going to be a lot of different issues talked about or brought up um, besides the ones that we discussed here. Those are going to be the major things. And I think a lot of it's around the sort of pharmacology, the training, sort of, you know, getting that understanding of, you know, certified midwife is distinct um and that there's other kinds of midwives but you know wh what is it about certified midwives that um and the, all the things you talked about it's master's level the same training as certified nurse midwives etc cetera, etc cetera. um you know that those are the things that will probably be raised that um would need to be considered um so I, I I really don't think that we have much more to discuss unless anybody has any points on uh, Dante or Amelia, anything you can think of? Okay. All right, well, I really wanna just thank all of you. Um, oh my gosh, is it, 
Wait, we're scheduled to 10 to 12, right? Okay, I was thinking, I was looking at my clock and thinking we've been we've been here for two hours, which is not the case. Um, so this is great. We're entering, we need an hour, and I think that's what we said. We might just need to meet for an hour. So I really appreciate this group, and I've really enjoyed this discussion and hearing from all of you and learning more about um, certified midwives and kind of digging into some of the issues. And um, I also really appreciate my colleagues, Dante and Malia and Sarah, who's on here too, that have been sort of behind the scenes or right here on the screen, um, kind of helping the, the, to move this along. And um, I also appreciate all the folks like Connecticut Hospital Association being here and um, the folks from nursing like Misty. Um, and we had Kim Sandor from the Connecticut Nurses Association earlier, who was sorry that she couldn't make these meetings, but I told her that Misty was representing nurses well. So uh, that was good. And um, so, so thank you all. And um, once we get our report ready, um, we will we will get it out to you all once it's finalized and it gets all its internal approvals. Um, we'll get it out for you and those of you who are going to be um, pushing for this in the next session. I wish you luck and um, I'm excited to see what happens with this. So thank you all very, very much and I hope you have a great rest of 2023. Um, <laughs> and we'll see what happens in 2024. Gosh. All right. <laughs> Oh my, yeah. Oh, Dana, you're probably thinking what just popped into my head too during 2024. Uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, everybody. We will.